Welcome back to another book review. Today, we're going to be talking about Ludwig von Mises, Human Action. And um, let's just jump right into it, guys. This is a very large magnum opus economic treatise written by Mises in the later part of his life, which is really rewarding because Ludwig von Mises is one of the you know founders and fathers of the Austrian School of Economics. And I'm not going to get too much into the history of what that exactly means. I've, I've talked a lot about the Austrian School, and there's a lot of better resources where people can, can learn about the Austrian School. But I decided to pick this book up in the midst of being 14-day quarantined. And it was kind of I've always known about this book, but it was brought to my attention thanks to uh, Jeff Dice uh, at uh, the Mises Institute in Alabama. He started a podcast series to serve as a companion to this treatise because this is um, a doozy of a book. It's 900 pages of very well thought out, very um, detailed economic thought and Today, I'm going to be talking about the book in general. I'm going to be sharing my thoughts, but I do want to say that this is kind of like a, a, a very elementary, um, you know, sort of thoughts and very quickly done too, because there's just so much to unpack in this 900 pages. Um, it took me about six weeks to complete this book um, in total, and I'm very glad that I did. I'm very glad that I read it during this time. In my life, you know, I'm about to be 26, and I'm sorry, about to be 27 in July, and we are living in a time of economic chaos and a lot of uncertainty. And to be able to pick up this treatise and see the world through the lens of someone who was extremely learned, hmm. sorry, I I just woke up, so I definitely have to drink my coffee, but. Um, you know, this was someone who had studied many branches of academia, history, sociology, psychology, um, economics, and mathematics. You know, he, he had so much knowledge when he wrote this at the later part of his life. And it's really good because he incorporates so many different parts of um, just the world into his, his, his thinking. And this book was... How do I say? It was like very counter and countercultural and, and very much went against the mainstream academia and economics. And Mises was largely dismissed throughout his life by his uh, contemporaries because he was seen as being a, a financier or a, a being a financial tool of the elites, right? Because a lot of his research was actually funded by wealthy individuals instead of coming from the state. But what you actually learn in reading this, and what I think a lot of Austrians will tell you, is that this created a proper uh, alignment of incentives, right? Because one key difference uh, in the Austrian school and the Keynesian school is that the, the Keynesians start from an assumption that government should be in control of the money supply, and Austrians do not believe that. But enough about that. I'm going to do my best to talk about this book. And I want to start off with, you know, sort of. Two different, uh, un two different words, right? So catalactics. I had never heard of, of catalactics until I picked up this book. But I'm going to read what catalactics is described on uh, Wikipedia. It is a theory of the way uh, that free market systems reach exchange ratios and prices. It aims to analyze all actions based on monetary calculation and trace the formation of prices back to the point where the agent makes his or her choice. And so Mises believes that economics is... A catalactic science um, and what he means by that is that you know economics had become perverted into this mathematical um, you know attempt to be like like physics I think that uh, you know Jeffrey Dice in one of his podcasts which I will have that linked there's like so many episodes right um, I think there's like eight episodes in total but it's a, a great companion to to listen to while you're reading this. You know, every every so every couple hundred pages, there's like a podcast episode with a different professor, and it allows you to like feel like you're actually in a class reading this book, which just makes the text a lot more digestible. But um, yeah. So instead of trying to use mathematical models, 
what he uses is is praxeology and praxeology is the science of human action and this term was coined um, in 1890 by Alfred Espinas but it was really Ludwig von Mises who took this term and, and brought it to the mainstream and, and made it you know um, made it a part of economic thought and so I want to read a couple of things from the from part one about human action and about what economics is and this is these are the quote it is true that economics is a theoretical science and as such abstains from any judgment of value it is not its task to tell people what ends they should aim at it is a science of means to be applied for the attainment of ends chosen not to be sure a science of choosing the ends and he says that this treatise places economic problems within a broad frame of general theory of human action so um, what was very interesting is that he basically in the first part of the book sets up an epistemological framework for how he conceives of human action and the psychological and sociological aspects of that, but also um, an epistemological framework of how to deal with economics. And he, and he, you know, really gets, he dives into this in depth, but he, he, you know, I'll, I'll, he brings it back to this idea of human action. And we'll just go to his words here where he says, but it is different with man, meaning what makes man different from animal. Man is not a being who cannot help yielding to the impulses that most urgently ask for satisfaction. Man is a being capable of subduing his instincts, emotions, and impulses. He can rationalize his behavior. He chooses, in short, he acts. What distinguishes man from beasts is precisely that he adjusts his behavior deliberately. Man is the being that, that his inhibitions, that can master his impulses and desires, that has the power to suppress instinctive desires and impulses. And then this is a, another very important aspect of, of his praxeology, which nobody is in a position to substitute his own value judgment for those of acting individuals. It is vain to pass judgment on other people's aims and volitions. So what he means by that is like there is no kind of like objective good, right? So like if someone chooses to go inject heroin, you might not agree with the ends, but you can't say anything other than this man was pursuing an action to, uh, you know, better his own value judgment of, of the good and to achieve a particular end in that case, probably getting high and maybe to escape reality. But the point is, is that economics does not make value judgments and economics doesn't try to, um, it doesn't try to adjudicate. It simply tries to, it's not, it tries to be descriptive. Right, it tries to talk about the way things are, and um, there was another quote in here that I liked, but I can't seem to find it now. So, we're going to jump into the meat of the book, which the way the text is written. Right, at first he has sort of like, "Hey, this is what I think. Like, this is how I'm thinking. This is what I think economics is," and I think that this is where a lot of economic economists just like dismiss Ludwig was just in reading the beginning part of his book, because it was, you have to understand what he was doing during this time was like, it went against all their sensitivities, right? He was writing grandiose, um, I don't know what I'm trying to say other than to say he was, he was thinking a lot more macro and a lot more big picture than what PhD candidates at that time were expected to do and doctors were expected to do, which was to find a very small niche. And he even talks about this um, at you know a later part in the book, I think in, in you know volume five or six, where he talks about, you know, there is no labor economics, there is no um, agricultural economics, there is no all these subdivisions of economics that exist in, in you know universities. There is only economics and there is only praxeology and catalactics. And there is only determination of prices in a moment of time. And so trying to find like equilibrium, right? This is something you learn in like your micro one-on-one courses that, you know, markets exist in some sort of equilibrium. And he says, basically, the only useful thing from the way economics is taught and 
you know, traditional Western universities, is all boils down to that very first lesson of supply and demand. Because there can no be there can be no state of equilibrium. And he really gets into this in part four of the book, which is the meatiest part of the book. And this is like this is like the basic economics of of Thomas Sowell. You know, this is this is what I mean by that. This is where he gets into. I'll set, tell you guys how the the book is is um, exactly what you can expect. He starts with the scope and method of catalactics. Then he gets into the market. He gets into prices. He gets into indirect exchange. He gets into interest and credit expansions and work and wages and action and the passing of time. He gets into, you know, that's where he gets into um, time preference, which anyone who's familiar with Bitcoin and Safedine and Moose knows of this concept very well. And yeah, he gets into data in the market. And this is really where he he dives into his understanding of how the world works, how the gears turn. And I could not possibly try to distill this in this video in a way that would be of any use. So instead, what I did was I just wrote down a couple of sections from the book that I found the most interesting to me. And actually not even the most, just as I like flip through the book again. I mean, look, like this is one of those books that you are going to mark. I mark the mess out of it because I have the belief that I will review or like come back to this book at some point later in my life. But um, I just want to share some of these things for the sake of prosperity, for anyone who's thinking about picking up this book, anyone who's familiar with my, you know, my reading and, and wants to just, just stay up to date with what I've been doing. This is the reason why I haven't done a book review in so long, because I've been, you know, trying to get through this and also preparing for my son, who is to be delivered in July or expected to be born in July. So a lot of moving parts. Oh, also, I moved. So I don't know if you guys can tell, we are now in my office. I'm in a new location. I've never shot here before. I got all my books in the back, which makes me very, very happy. Um, they used to just be scattered on the ground. No bookshelf or anything like that. But um, yeah, so let's get into, I'm on page 517. I think this correlates with the scholar's edition, which guys, I have a very like nice copy of this book because I um, kind of like that. But you can get a paperback version of this book at Mises.org for like less than 10 bucks. So there's really no excuse not to have this book. And when I first stumbled upon the book, Jeff Dice, he was basically, he pitched the book in, you know, the first podcast episode, which just came up on YouTube. And he pitched the book saying like, this is a hard book to get through, you know, like 99.9% .9 of humans won't get through this book. But if you do, there's so much value to be obtained from doing so. And he's 100% correct because I couldn't have thought of a better time to have read this book and to just get a, a such a, a level of understanding of what's going on in the world in terms of you know international trade, in terms of this massive supply and demand shock, in terms of coronavirus, in terms of interventionism. And, um, you know, Recently, they passed a, you know, every American got $1,200 and, and, and what does socialism mean? And, and how do you, and he really gets into sort of comparing socialism to capitalism in, what part is that? Parts five through, I don't remember if it's six or seven or five, um, but basically volume three of the edition that I have. But um, anyways, let's get into these, these different excerpts and I'm going to tell you guys what I think. And this one spoke to me because I very much see myself as an investor and someone who tries to think global and, and big picture and an entrepreneur. And yeah, so this is what he has to say. It's interesting. Earlier in the book, he talks about every human being being an entrepreneur. And so his understanding of what an entrepreneur is is a lot different because he thinks we're all entrepreneurs because we're all making calculations about the future and making projections about the future and trying to, you know, with different degrees of success trying to navigate um, how we see the future playing out and aligning, aligning our behavior in a way that gets us a maximum result. So, but an investor, this is where he talks about being an investor. The, in, the investor is free to alter, pardon. The investor is free to alter the investment of his funds. 
If he is able to anticipate the future state of the market more correctly than other people, he can succeed in choosing only investments whose price will rise and in avoiding investments whose price will drop. Blah, 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 blah. Stock exchange speculation and analogous transactions outside the securities market determine on whom the indic determine on whom the incidence of these profits and losses shall fall. A tendency prevails to make a sharp distinction between such purely speculative ventures. I'm just making sure that the camera. A tendency prevails to make a sharp distinction between such purely speculative ventures and genuinely sound investment. The distinction is one of degree only. There is no such thing as a non-speculative investment. In a changing economy, action always involves speculation. Investments may be good or bad, but they are always speculative. A radical change in conditions may render bad even investments commonly considered perfectly safe. So I thought this was very interesting because um, Thomas Sowell makes the distinction between investment and speculation in basic economics. And basically Ludwig von Mises is saying, no, there's actually no distinction between these two actions. And it's only a matter of degree. But basically, all investments are speculation. And I think that this is a true statement. And as a cryptocurrency investor, and as a, you know, I guess I've always seen it as speculation, because um, speculation, as defined by Thomas Sewell, is a very particular um, action taken in economies in which someone with more knowledge basically holds on to a commodity, um, buys a commodity with the expectation that their knowledge allows them to know that in a future date and time, they'll be able to, um, you know, make a profit by taking on the risk. And so let's say like a farmer could, you know, sell his wheat to a speculator in, you know, let's say in June, because he's not sure what the market will look like in November. But, um, yeah, this, it just was, um, you know, I like, I like the equity market. I, I think I'm, I see myself as a crypto analyst, an independent crypto analyst is how I kind of identify. And I very much use ideas from Benjamin Graham and Warren Buffett, you know, value investing. And I apply these ideas to the crypto space in trying to come up with investments in investment theses. But a lot of what I do is kind of like venture capital and like kind of like gambling, I guess, or speculation because, you know, you really are making bets on teams and on how you think the future will, for example, MakerDAO is an investment I recently started making. And this is a protocol that issues a stable coin. Okay. It's very, but it's a, a currency, a digital currency that's pegged to the US dollar. But what's interesting about the protocol is how the governance of the protocol allows for um, essentially, there's no central point of failure because there's no central entity who's issuing the token. It's actually governed by a distributed uh, set of token holders. And uh, and basically, the thesis there is that I'm making a bet about how the future is going to play out in terms of this evolution from meat space into the digital realm, right? And, and I think MakerDAO has a potential in that future. Well, let's move on now to page 522 in my book, which I thought was extremely timely because he talks about, and this is what I wrote, star, holy shit, why hyperinflation takes so long. And so I have talked about in previous investment videos, you guys go check out my quarter two update cryptocurrency 2020 investment video where I talk about, I believe we've entered into a play, uh, stage of stagflation in the economy. And I might be a little premature in this uh, in the timing, but I don't think I'm wrong in terms of how that this plays out over the long term, the next three to five years. And so I want to read a little bit about hyperinflation. <clears throat> now, let us assume that an increase in the quantity of credit money or fiat money or credit expansion produces the additional money required for an expansion of the individual's cash holdings. The three processes that take their course independently. A tendency towards a fall in commodity prices brought about by the increase in the amount of capital goods available and the resulting expansion of production activities. A tendency towards a fall in the prices brought about by an increased demand of money for cash holdings. And finally, a tendency towards a rise in prices brought about by the increase in the supply of money in the broader sense. The three processes are the same extent synchronous. Each of them brings about its particular effects, which, according to the circumstances, may be intensified or weakened by the opposite effects originating from one of the other two. But the main thing is that the capital goods resulting from the additional savings are not destroyed by the 
by the coincident monetary changes, changes in the demand for and supply of money in the broader sense. Whenever an individual devotes a sum of money to saving instead of spending it for consumption, the process of saving agrees perfectly with the process of capital accumulation and investment. It does not matter whether the individual saver does not or do, does or does not increase his cash holding. The act of saving always has its counterpart in the supply of goods produced and not consumed of goods available for further production activities. A man's savings are always embodied in concrete capital goods. Um, but what I got from that, so he was talking about, you know, the expansion of money and of credit. And during this time, essentially, there's three different processes that are taking place. So as the Fed prints trillions and trillions of dollars, you're going to have some people who save money. You have some people who go out and spend that money to maybe buy. And hopefully they're buying like useful capital goods, like I think a computer or maybe some farming equipment, something that can produce um, things for them in the in the long term. And then there's also going to be I forgot what the third uh, thing is. Um, the third thing is there's going to be a tendency towards the increasing in prices of things. So commodities and goods are going to become more expensive because there's more money in the, in the system, right? And so basically what he's getting at is that when money enters into the economy, simultaneously, three different price, um, I guess, valves are being maneuvered. And some of them are inflationary. Some of them are deflationary. And it's the balancing of these two or these three um, activities that eventually determines whether we are, you know, inflating or prices are inflating or prices are deflating. And you can see this like over the last 10 years, um, we've seen a lot of price deflation in the technology space because you can buy a better computer, a better laptop for cheaper, but we've seen a lot of inflation in healthcare and um, education, right? So that's kind of a, the best example I can really come up with. Um, I just thought it was very interesting to think about this is why it takes so long for hyperinflation or prices to um, be reflected in, say, like a loaf of bread, right? But we're going to get more into credit expansion and essentially talk about the oil industry as an Oki. This is an industry very uh, near and dear to my heart. But I thought reading what he says about interest and credit expansion. Um, and the market really helped me understand what, how malinvestment can play out. And basically, those of you who are unfamiliar, fracking is a tool used by oil explorers in which they like put you know some liquid into the ground. It fracks it. They're able to extract oil a little bit more efficiently or get more oil that they couldn't previously reach. And in doing so, it like moves the seismic plates, but it's also very capital intensive, right? It takes a lot of um, takes a lot of money to be able to to have the equipment to frack, and you know we've recently seen negative oil prices, and basically what we're seeing is in the U.S. most oil producers need oil to be at forty dollars a barrel in order to be profitable, comfortably comfortably profitable, but in other parts of the country like Venezuela. And Russia and Saudi Arabia, this is not the case. They can produce oil and be profitable at, let's say, $2 a barrel. And, and now, clearly, they can just flood oil into the market because they really don't – it has no price for them because it's so abundant. And so really what I'm getting at in this in these sections is thinking about, well, how did malinvestment take place in the United States? How were – how was Continental Resources able to secure so much funding for, for fracking? And – the foregoing statement explains why an expansion in the production facilities and the production of heavy industries and the production of durable producers goods is the most conspicuous market for the boom, meaning inflation. Of course, the boom affects also the consumer's good industry. They too invest more and expand their production capacity. However, the new plants and the new annexes added to the already existing plants are not always those for, for the product of which, of which the demand of the public is most intense. A sharp rise in commodity prices is not always an attending phenomenon of the boom. 
The increase of the quantity of fiduciary media certainly always has the potential effect of making prices rise, but it may happen that at the same time, forces operating in the opposite direction are strong enough to keep the rise in prices with narrow limits or even to remove it entirely. That's on page uh, 560. I forgot. On 559, he says, the essence of the credit expansion boom is not overinvestment, but, but investment in wrong lines, i.e. malinvestment. Um, da, 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 da. Okay, skip that, skip that. On 576, he says, Advocates of credit expansion have furthermore emphasized that some of the malinvestments made in the boom later become profitable. These investments, they say, were made too early, i.e. at a date when the state of supply of the capital goods and the valuations of the consumers were not yet allowed, not yet allowed their construction. However, the habit cause was not too bad, as these projects would have been executed anyway at a later date. So we can think about that in terms of fracking, right? Like now we're sitting at a, a point in time where, well, we put all this investment into equipment to allow for the extraction of oil that we don't actually need right now. But at some time in the future, we may actually need that. So it's OK is what it kind of like what advocates of credit expansion say is that it's okay that we have this malinvestment because although we might not need it right now, we'll use it in the future. So the malinvestment is justified. But um, I think what you learn as you read this is that it just, it distorts um, the ability for people to make proper um, catalactic conclusions. We'll just, we'll just leave it at that. And yeah, so there's another thing he talked about, about patents. I thought this was very interesting as someone who's about to start law school. Um, you know, he'd basically be in kind of anti-copyright uh, law, anti-patent. Um, in granting a patent to an invent inventor, the authorities do not investigate the invention's economic significance. They are concerned merely with the priority of the idea and limit their examination to technological problems. They deal with the same impartial scrupulousness with an invention which revolutionizes a whole industry and with some trifling gadget, the usefulness of which is, ob which is obvious. Thus, patent protection is provided to a vast number of quite worthless inventions. Their authors are ready to overrate the importance of their contribution to the progress of technological knowledge and build exaggerated hopes upon the material game it could bring them. Disappointed, they grumble about the absurdity of the economic system that deprives the people of the benefit of the technological progress. So, yeah, I thought about this in terms of like all these like black blockchain patents that JP Morgan and all these like big companies have been trying to, you know, put out into the world and it's like a lot of these are just useless patents and I'm not a big fan of, of intellectual like of, of patents on a, like a on like a philosophical level but um I, I wrote page 501 I don't know what's on this page that I found so interesting but we're going to jump to it oh this is what he wrote and I thought this was very interesting just in terms of the relationship between China and the United States right now, and really all foreign countries uh, with each other, because basically what the coronavirus has done, it has put us into like this, this um, every man for himself sort of uh, posturing of the different states, really a return to nationalism and a return to domestication of, of supply chains, because people realize that when a crisis hits, they need to be able to protect their own people and they need to... Um, yeah, so they and they they need to not have their supply chains disturbed. You know, we have like lack of food and lack of masks here in the United States and, and things of that nature. Protective equipment for medical staff. This is what he says. Mises. We're on the eve of the complete disintegration of the international capital market. The economic consequences of the events are obvious. Its political repercussions are unpredictable. Blah, 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 blah. In fact, the intention, the internationalization of the capital market, together with free trade and the freedom of migration, was instrumental in removing the economic incentives to war and conquest. It no longer mattered for a man where the political boundaries of his country were drawn. The entrepreneur and the investor were not checked by them. The disappearance of the international capital markets alters conditions entirely. It abolishes the freedom of access to natural resources. 
It is illusory to assume that the advanced nations will acquiesce forever in such a state of affairs. They will resort to the only method which gives them access to badly needed raw materials. They will resort to conquest. War is the alternative to freedom of foreign investment as realized by the international capital markets. Investments in lending abroad are only possible if the receiving nations are unconditionally and sincerely committed to the principle of private property and do not plan to expropriate the foreign capitalists at a later date. So, I, I won't get into too much detail about why I saw that as very, um, what's the word, just very relevant to the state of the world today, other than to say, this this closing of borders, this return to nationalism, this the the fear of um, the rule of law not being upheld, whether it be you know Chinese investors who've invested in American real estate or um, Americans who have invested in Chinese companies, and and fears of um, you know I was listening to a podcast with Marian Cantusa and I forgot who else. Um, but essentially they were talking about gold mining companies and where some of these companies are located, what countries they're located in. And, you know, you could have an investment in a country like, let's say, Turkey, where um, if things start going bad, the government's going to nationalize the gold mining and take over those companies. So your investments are at risk. But essentially, this, these protective measures lead to war. And it's exactly freedom of, of markets and, and freedom of people in the protection of private property that leads to prosperity. And this is one of the reasons why I believe that technology such as Bitcoin and, um, you know, basically uh, smart contracts, if that's what you want to call them, but using technology to secure property rights um, in, in all aspects in, of the market, I think is will be very paramount to a future of freedom and prosperity if that's what we want if we want the world to be a more open place if we want you know there to be less war if we want humans to cooperate together to tackle some of these very important issues like climate change and this video has got to be one of the longest book reviews i've ever done i had a lot to say i hope this was useful i hope this was uh entertaining um if you've read this book, if you haven't read this book, regardless, let me know what you think in the comments and tell me where you think some of my analysis can be off, what you think about my analysis, if you agree with what I have to say. And yeah, really look forward to hearing from you guys. Thank you for watching. And soon you'll see more videos. Um, right now I'm reading Law School Confidential. So I think these next couple of book reviews are going to be very heavy on the law. But um, I yeah, don't think I'll have too much time to read a lot of economics in the coming three years. So I was very happy that I got to tackle that, you know, that magnum opus uh, and really just, uh, just a rewarding read. So I highly recommend it to anyone. Five out of five stars. Thank you for watching. I'll see you in the next video. Peace.